Mother's Day, a day that's supposed to be a happy day where you show gifts to your mother, the one that brought you into this world, who's taking care of you and who's raised you. But that didn't happen in this case. I'm going to talk about a case today that uh, I was personally involved in when I was still active with the sheriff's office running the crime reconstruction team. And I got one of those calls you're not really expecting on that day. When I look at my wife on Mother's Day, I'm supposed to be spending time with. And now I've got to leave to bring my team to a scene that um, was one of the hor most horrible scenes I've ever seen. So without further ado, let's get into it. Hi everybody, welcome. My name is Johnny and on this channel, I help true crime enthusiasts understand the inner workings of criminal investigations by kind of pulling back the curtain and taking you behind the scenes on how we investigate things. So if that's something you're into, consider subscribing, hit the notification bell. All right, let me talk about a case that uh, I was involved in. I am sitting at home uh, with my wife on Mother's Day and my phone goes off. And I pick up the phone, and it's uh, a sergeant, a non-duty sergeant. And he calls and says, hey, Sarge, we need your team. Uh, we have a homicide. So uh, he gives me the address over in, in Colton, Oregon. And I send a page out to the rest of my team, and we gather everybody, and we start heading to the scene of this homicide. Now, this is nighttime. We roll up to this house. It's a single-level house. There's a bunch of deputy sheriffs there and fire trucks, so on and so forth. And I get briefed. It says there is a female victim inside the house. So uh, my team and I, we glove up, we you know booty up and everything and, and take all the precautions for biohazard because they told me there was a lot of blood in there. So I get a brief from the on-duty sergeant and we set up all of our gear and we start to make entry into the house. Now, trigger warning, I'm going to talk about some kind of things that are, I am seeing in this house. So if uh, you have a queasy stomach, oh, and I'm also going to show some photographs. So if, if that may trigger you in any way, then uh, please, just please, this is a, just a warning that's, that's going to happen. Okay. So we step into the, the door right where the front door is, and uh, we're just kind of assessing to see what we can see. And it looks like something out of a horror movie. There is blood everywhere. There is blood on the floor. There's blood on countertops. There's blood on carpet. There's blood on tables. There's blood on different things throughout the entire room. Um, there's wipes. There's 90 degree drops. There's looks like what appears to be bloody footprints, uh, dog, bloody dog prints. Uh, it was something. So you literally at, at that point as investigators, you know, you just have to sit there and um, just take it all in and, and take this process extremely slow uh, to not disturb anything. We, we start to make our way in. I look, I look into one of the rooms and I see a female laying face down um, in a room. I look over towards the kitchen and there I see a, a kind of a saw, um, kind of a, a wood saw, you know, a curved kind of saw. And it's uh, on the kitchen table, on the, or actually on the countertop. Now, also on the countertop is a dog laying on its side, deceased, uh, covered in blood. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, who, who would commit a murder like this? And then what did the, you know, what did the dog do? It was like a little, little dachshund looking dog. And uh, look, he, the suspect put the dog up on the counter and, and stabbed the dog multiple times, which was horrible. You know, as an animal lover myself, I, I can't imagine abusing a pet like that. Um, so we continue just to do our, you know, investigation. We bring in a scanner. We um, scan the entire scene dining room, kitchen, hallways, trying not to disturb anything. We still have boots on, but making our way around where we're not disturbing or, or covering up any evidence. We then make our way into the bedroom where the deceased female is. And we continue to we scan that in high detail and, 
and photograph and start looking around for a potential weapon. Well, we did find a weapon, one of the weapons we think was the primary weapon, and that was a Green Hulk hand. Now, this Green Hulk hand had a kind of a rod. You stick your hand up in it, grab onto the rod, and so the, the whole Hulk hand is like that, and it's ceramic, and it's covered in blood. So we knew that the suspect had used this weapon at some point um, to disable the female to a point where um, she was no longer living. And there were, you know, on the wall, there was impact spatter on the wall. There was, the carpet was saturated in blood. There's blood all over the walls and the computer screen. And just so, it just, a, just a violent, violent scene in there. We continue to process the scene. We call the medical examiner in there. And, and what I'm about to tell you is the, the real, the horrible part is that the female was decapitated and her head was missing. We, you know, it's it's one of those scenes where, where that act happened was in that room just because the carpet was so saturated in blood. There was no other evidence in the house where that had taken place. And where the saw was in the kitchen, um, there was some activity here around there too. There was some 90 degree drop stuff in the sink where he had moved around and possibly, you know, put the, the saw there as well. There was just, you know, evidence everywhere, all over the place. Um, so we continued to process the scene and the medical examiner came in and we helped put her in the body bag and then continued on with it the rest of the scanning when she was gone and helping to identify any other kind of evidence that we saw in there. Now, who lives in this house normally? We have Tina Marie Webb, who's 59 years old, her son, Joshua Webb, who's 36 years old, and her husband, David Webb, who is 59 years old. Now, Joshua, he lived in an outbuilding on the home because he's got some kind of mental issues and wasn't really living in the house. But the husband, David, had left at 4.15 that morning he went to work. Now, around that same time, 911 call comes in to our dispatch center. And guess what that is? That is a harvest market that's over in Estacada, which is a, an adjoining city. And the caller states that there is a guy in the store holding a human head. Joshua Webb, after killing his mother, takes her head, puts it in the front seat of the car, and drives into town parks up at the market, gets out of the car, grabs his mother's head, walks into the store all the way back to the cooler, sets his mother's head down, opens the cooler, grabs some orange crush out of there, and starts drinking it. Well, the employee, this draws a little bit of attention. Oh, he has a knife in his hand. So this draws the attention of employees who confront him. There's another guy named David who's there who kind of confronts him, and next thing you know, Joshua stabs him and starts stabbing the, the, uh, the gentleman, David, right there in the back of the store. So now people are starting to go, holy crap, what the heck is going on? And they start to take action. Well, they end up tackling this guy, Joshua, uh, the son, onto the floor, and he continues to fight them with a knife in his hand. So one of the patrons continues to punch and punch and punch, probably punching him in the head. Um, they're all on top of him, and they are able to get the knife away from him and then get the duct tape off aisle six and just like a rodeo, duct tape his hands and feet so that he can't move anymore. So now they're on this guy. They've already called 911, and now the sheriff's office is rolling over to that scene. So it's a melee of two different scenes at the same time. Uh, now we have one scene at the house and we have one scene now at the market. So the sheriff's office shows up. Um, they get him up into custody. Now the patrons have put a box over the top of uh, his mother's head. Deputy lifts it up, notices what it is for sure, and takes takes action and gets the suspect out of there into custody. Medical checks him out to make sure he's not the suspect isn't injured. Medical's there for David, the um, patron that was in there that got stabbed as well, and they rush him off in an ambulance. And then now we have two scenes that the sheriff's office is working at that point. So the medical examiner is going from one scene to retrieve her body there and then going to another scene to retrieve um, the other half of her. So um, 
this investigation um, goes on for a while, right? Um, Oregon State Police comes out to assist because there's there's so much to process as far as evidence and forensics. And they take Mr. Joshua Webb into custody. Now, what happens to Joshua Webb? Well, uh, I'm going to play a little bit of a news coverage here for you so that you can actually see a little bit about the story that I just told you, and then we'll come back and talk about it. Also tonight, the case that rocked a small town is finally over. Today, the man accused of decapitating his own mother on Mother's Day pleaded guilty except for insanity. Now, after the murder, Joshua Lee Webb walked into an Estacada grocery store holding his mom's severed head and stabbed Mike Wagner, a store employee. The judge is sending Webb to the state mental hospital where he'll be supervised and treated. But the families of both victims say that is not enough. K2's Keaton Thomas is live in Oregon City for us. So, Keaton, why is that? Well, you know, the families of both victims say that they don't feel like this is punishment enough, especially considering what he did, and they feel like he's almost getting away with the crime. Joshua Lee Webb barely changed his expression in court Tuesday. He didn't say anything except for answering questions from the judge. Got a clear head about you this, to, this morning? Yeah. Oh. He waived a jury trial and pleaded guilty, except for insanity, to murder, abuse of a corpse, attempted murder, aggravated animal abuse, and assault. He lacked the mental, substantial mental capacity either to appreciate the criminality of his conduct or to uh, conform his conduct to the requirements of the law. According to court documents, Webb had been acting strangely and paranoid in the months leading up to the Mother's Day incident. At one point, he turned over his firearms to local police because he thought he was dangerous. Two doctors evaluated Webb, and they said that he had suffered from some type of schizophrenia or other psychotic disorder. Even though he's on medication now, doctors say he's still hearing voices. On the one-year anniversary, Mike Wagner, the man who was stabbed at the grocery store, told me that he's doing better than ever. In court, his daughter, Stephanie, read a statement. The initial shock was both traumatizing and beyond painful. She said her family is disappointed. Webb will be going to a hospital instead of prison, worried that he'll be let out. And in a statement, Webb's sister also said that he should be in prison. But prosecutors asked the victims to trust the doctors and trust Webb won't be let out if he's a danger to the community. So as you can see, a lot of schizophrenia, a lot of mental disorders. But what would cause him to kill his mother? Only he knows in his mind. She was beloved, worked at the church, was a master gardener just like my mother was, had a degree in horticulture. Not anything that would depict him committing murder on, on her. And especially to the extent that he that he did, taking it that neck that extra step, and to you know destroy a body and dismember a body was is just way beyond what anybody can comprehend. And it happens on Mother's Day, a mother who had let you come back to the house and gave you a roof and place to stay, and this is how you repay her. Now he's going to a psychiatric custody for hopefully forever. I mean, uh, who knows uh, with that with that state and that judicial system, how that's going to fare out. But for right now, he is in a psychiatric ward being held, in, which, is, which is where he should be. He should never be allowed to, to get out again. Well, thanks so much for watching, and let me share that experience that I had in my career. It still sticks with me to this day. It's just a horrible thing. Every now, every, every Mother's Day, I think about getting that call in the night, which uh, I shouldn't. It's been since 2017, and that's 2023 right now. But um, love and hug your mothers. I wish mine was still here, and um, that's the end of the story. All right, guys, thanks, thanks so much, and take care of yourself.